Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Build Series. I'm your host, Cole Delbick. 30 years ago, no one could have imagined the recent explosion of LGBTQ representation we've seen on screen, as the community has continued to find dynamic and powerful ways to communicate the breadth of the queer experience. And since the early 80s, Newfest has been a home for these stories, enduring through the decades to become one of the leading LGBTQ film festivals in the world, and the preeminent one here in New York City. Ahead of the 31st annual festival, which kicks off later this month, we're joined today by executive director David Hatkoff, director of programming and operations, Nick McCarthy, development manager Radhika Rajkumar, and filmmaker Alexis Clements to talk about the upcoming slate of films. Before we bring them out, let's take a look at what we can expect from this year's new fest. It's about expression. You are the art, and it's extreme. The art is extreme. Look at the Sistine Chapel. That is an extreme, what is? Let's give it up for Newfest, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining me today, and congratulations on 31 years of supporting queer talent and queer filmmakers. That's amazing. Let's hear it again. Before we dive in, I want to sort of give everyone a scope of this festival because it's really sort of an incredible feat. Um, there are 27 narrative features, 14 doc features, 15 episodic series, eight centerpiece and spotlight screenings, and 100 shorts from around the world. That is amazing. I mean, it must have been a huge ordeal to gather all these stories into one place. Tell us a little bit of what this past year has been like to get to this moment. As you said, it's 160 films from more than 30 countries, so the scale is pretty uh, immense, and it's all happening within seven days. So it's, uh, it's fast and furious, a lot of queer stories, every aspect of queer life will be represented, and Nick and his programming team uh, have been working tirelessly over the last year to, um, to put together a really amazing lineup. Yeah, what's really wonderful is that um, the programming team gets to travel throughout the world at other LGBTQ film festivals and mainstream festivals as well um, to pick out the best films that possibly exist that include queer characters, especially queer characters at the front of their story. Um, very much everyone always asks, like, what is a queer film? Uh, what does it mean for an LGBTQ film festival? And it's that our stories are being represented by queer filmmakers and also featuring leads that are queer. Um, and the process of finding them is is both easy and difficult, let's say. Um, we have a submissions process uh, that is open to everyone. Um, they can submit through Film Fury starting in March, uh, and submissions start in March and go through July when they close. Um, this year we had a record number of submissions, over 700 that came through. Um, and beyond that, we of course solicit from other film festivals when we see a masterpiece that we know will connect with our New York audiences, and we invite it to have its New York premiere here. So we go through a rigorous process. Um, it's me and uh, three people on my programming team, as well as 25 other um, experts in the field, um, community partners um, who review all the submissions um, and come from all different backgrounds and parts of the LGBTQ experience. So we know that we have the most authentic people screening these films um, and able to tell us that these stories are capturing exactly what we want to present to the world too. 
You know, I think oftentimes young queer people first encounter our LGBTQ representation in like secret or in shame. And I think it's so important that this festivals and festivals like this exist because it sort of amplifies diverse, positive, empowering stories, um, yeah, especially for our young people. So maybe to get to know you guys a little bit better, I'd love to hear um, about how sort of queer culture found you. Like what was the first time that you felt seen on screen and how did that shape your identity? Maybe we can start with you. Oh, um, you know, that's kind of a hard question for me to answer because I had kind of a different coming to my queerness than I think a lot of people I know did. Um, it was, it kind of just started from within me at a pretty young age. I came out when I was 15. Um, and it was always just something that was with me that I kind of wanted to express. And I didn't really, I wasn't really looking for anyone else's opinions on it. Um, and especially because of the way that I present, like I'm very straight passing. Um, so it sometimes wasn't really about seeing how I looked on screen or seeing someone who looked like me, but seeing people that I was friends with and that I was dating and just seeing you know, visibly queer people out and about, I think was, was really what it was for me. Well said. Lexi? Yeah, I, I would have to say something similar in the sense that, um, you know, there's not a lot of queer representation out there to this day in the sense that there's never enough, right? We, we're constantly creating new stories because we don't necessarily see our particular slice of the queer life represented. Um, and certainly that motivated me in making my film. But I would similarly say that my most sort of um, gratifying experience of seeing other queer folks who I felt reflected by was in person, in queer community spaces, actually, which is probably why I made a film yeah. about it. <laughs> we'll get all into that yeah. later, mm -hmm. um, David. For me, it was a, a really beautiful British film called Beautiful Thing uh, that I saw uh, shortly after I came out, and I watched it at home on a VHS, VHS tape. Um, and I thought about it a lot when Love, Simon came out a couple of years ago because I saw that in a sold-out movie theater in Union Square, and it was really emotional imagining what it would have been like to be able to experience that as a young person. Um, representation... Uh, and visibility were not part of my experience growing up. And uh, and I'm, I feel very fortunate to now uh, work for an organization that is providing a platform to artists to be able to raise the visibility and reach these audiences and collect these audiences so that it doesn't have to happen at quiet, um, at home, in shame, and it can be a collective experience that we share together. Yeah, and similarly, um, so I, I would say I'm a bit of a night owl, so it works out really well that my parents have gone to sleep and I have IFC on and midnight is coming around. And for some reason, a lot of queer programming happened in the later hours for IFC. Um, I mean, a lot of networks too at the time. So, you know, in my parents' basement with the cable on, um, one of the films that I saw was actually high art. Um, so it's not even just a gay male narrative, um, but uh, there's something about it that captured um, the distinct kind of like queer attraction. Um, and I knew that like if the door opened to the basement, I would be like, oh my God, like are my parents gonna see that I'm watching something queer and know that I'm queer? And that sort of helped me understand how queer I was and how much it meant to watch something and be so possessive of that. Um, so as David mentioned, there's something really special about being able to work for an organization that is in the, you know, in the arena of sharing this, of spreading the word, of not just providing this visibility, but providing the platform for it to be amplified throughout the world as well. Um, and uh, going back to sort of what David mentioned about Love, Simon, um, two years ago we were really honored to be able to work with Fox Searchlight and host an exclusive high school screening of the film before its release. Uh, and I've never seen a more excited audience um, <laughs> delight at an on-screen kiss. Um, they could have shattered glass with the way that everyone just like <laughs> shouted afterwards. Um, so so that was kind of uh, oh. providing this to beyond is something That's really so meaningful. That's so heartwarming. Um, you know, New Fast has been in the game for so long, and it started in the uh, sort of early 80s, at the height of the AIDS crisis. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious, how has the vision and sort of the demands of a festival like this evolved um, since then? And maybe, David, you can speak to this, because you just sort of recently came on as the executive director. Sort of what did you want to have your hand in um, this year? I did just recently come on and I feel fortunate to have joined an organization that has such a long history uh, and that over the past uh, five years or so has transitioned into being a year round organization. So the festival is the centerpiece of the year and it really is our sort of loud moment to, to 
to show this uh, massive quantity of films in a short period of time. But um, this is something that we want to make sure that we're cultivating these audiences and providing this space uh, for queer folks and for allies all, all year round. Um, I think it's also um, really important for us to know what it is to be a New York film festival. Um, queer life in New York is um, a singular kind of queer life. And um, you know we live in such, um, in an international city, in um, an intersectional city, um, that um, there's no two queer people are exactly the same, and, and they all have really incredible stories to tell. So this year, we are both opening and closing our festival with films set in New York. One is a romantic comedy uh, about, it's an ensemble, um, about a, a group of friends and their sort of relationship uh, challenges, and uh, the other is um, a Bolivian film that is actually uh, set here in New York about a father who tries to reconnect, uh, or who tries to connect with his late son's partner. Um, so they're very different kinds of films, but they're both set in New York, and so I think as we approach the programming, we're thinking about it uh, very specifically through that New York lens. Yeah, I mean, you speak to sort of representing the breadth of the community, and it's really uh, sort of heartening to see that this year. I was reading, so it's you know, 11 offerings from first-time uh, feature filmmakers, 54% of the films directed by women, trans, or non-binary filmmakers, and then additionally, 71% of the content is uh, about or by underrepresented voices. And so this is like a, you know, to take an intersectional approach to the programming, I think it's gonna mean so much to the person sitting in that theater. So, I mean, a big congrats all around. Um, there are so many worthwhile films to talk about, it's a little overwhelming, but I would love to hear from each of you maybe one that is particularly speaking to you or sort of a section of the festival um, to just sort of get a little, like what's the pitch? What's the one, that movie that we gotta see? Maybe you can start with you. Hmm. Um, well, it is hard to choose. Yeah. Um, I would say that I'm really excited for actually a whole slate of films. Um, we have a slate of women and non-binary focused films that's happening on uh, Friday the 25th during the festival. It's called My Girl Friday, um, sort of a nod to His Girl Friday. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really excited for that whole slate. Uh, there's a whole variety of shorts and episodics and features in there, um, all kinds of uh, intersex, non-binary, women, trans content, everything you could possibly ask for kind of in one unified space. Um, and it's, it's nice to create that kind of programming space within the festival to really feature those marginalized voices and like you said kind of bring a very intersectional perspective to a specific day of the festival um, and then that actually ends in an after party at the ace hotel so we also wanted to create that physical space again make it a really celebratory moment um, and that's free and open to the public so we hope to see you all there i hope to see all of you there <laughs> Alexis, I mean, your film sort of explores the shuttering of queer spaces for women uh, around the country, and we've seen that mm -hmm. here in New York City as well. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your film. Yeah, um, I think a lot of folks are aware that the queer bars are closing. It's a kind of constant headline that we see. Um, I think primarily, initially, it was a lot of talk about the queer women's spaces, but gay men are also seeing this happen in their spaces, and certainly um, trans spaces or spaces that are centered around people who maybe don't fit in that binary have always struggled. Um, but what I really wanted to do was try to get away from that sort of sad and depressing narrative that we hear constantly, because remember, folks, straight bars struggle too. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I wanted to look um, um, not just at bars, but also at spaces that have stuck around. Mm. I think we're in a moment where everybody who lives in a city can recognize that holding on to community, holding on to housing is really challenging. Um, and I, I really thought there are, there's got to be lessons that we can learn from the spaces that have, have, that have stuck it out. And I think those lessons actually translate beyond the queer community. I looked at the communities that I know best, so that's why I made this film. But my hope is that folks who aren't queer could also gain some, some information from the film as well. Yeah, I can't wait to see. Who are you? I think the film, uh, there's a, a ton of amazing films, but the one that I'm most excited about is a US premiere of a film called Drag Kids, um, which is about four young drag performers ages nine to 12 who uh, are located in, in uh, various locations and feeling really isolated and different. And um, they come together to perform at Montreal Pride. And there's this moment when the four of them meet and sort of recognize uh, themselves in each other and, and vice versa, that's that's really beautiful. But it's also 
a really heartwarming representation of um, parenting and parents who are very accepting and supportive of their kids. Um, we're partnering with PFLAG uh, as a community partner on that documentary, and um, I think audiences will um, find themselves with tears in their eyes. It's, it's a really special film. And Nick? I can only get one. Uh, no. Um, Sorry, so, no. No, 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 of course, no. Beyond, um, uh, I'm particularly excited about our world premieres. Um, of course, we have all New York premieres for all of our feature films, um, but the world premieres mean so much more for New Fest to be able to herald these into the world um, and greet new audiences and then see you know, them go beyond. Um, so beyond, of course, all we've got, uh, Alexis's wonderful documentary. Um, we're really excited about the world premiere of a film called Siberian Him, um, which is actually uh, a gay Russian film. Um, and it focuses on a meek farmhand uh, whose brother-in-law is a policeman and they go on a journey to um, see their grandmother and in the process have a relationship that is star-crossed and fraught. Um, but it has this beautifully textured cinematography, um, sort of harkens back to Brokeback Mountain and sort of like set amongst the desolate landscape of Siberia. You see this love that is happening amidst an oppression, like oppressive country too. Um, so even beyond that world premiere as well, we have a world world premiere of a Brazilian film called Music for Bleeding Hearts, um, which is a really great kind of mixtape film um, and also a romantic comedy. Um, and we think it's really important, especially um, in queer spaces, not just to tell the stories of, you know, um, international advocacy for uh, spaces that don't have as many rights as we may have in this country, and as New Yorkers, we should stand up for that. Um, but to also show sort of the joy that exists throughout the world and throughout like the universal stories of queer love. Um, so uh, we actually wanted to really honor Brazil right now. Um, I'm sure everyone's aware that Bolsonaro, um, the president recently has threatened to cut off all funding to um, queer stories that are being funded by Ancine, their uh, national like uh, lottery, basically. Um, and we are highlighting Brazil, not just with the world premiere of Music for Bleeding Hearts, but with three other documentaries uh, and a shorts program that's dedicated specifically to queer Brazilian storytelling. Um, so that's something to definitely keep an eye out for. Um, and as David mentioned, we are an international and intersectional city. So it is our, you know, I think responsibility to be able to provide the platform to tell these stories throughout the world too. Yeah, I had previously actually screened Queen of Lapa, which is this um, documentary about sex workers working in a neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro, and, and it was really incredible, sort of just like a fly on the wall approach. Um, and yeah, I was so glad to see the international contingent at the festival, um, sort of spanning all over the world and sort of taking in consideration the challenges that those filmmakers face bringing their stories to light. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the marketing of this festival because in a city like New York, it's so competitive, I imagine, uh, with all these events going on. But you guys have taken a really sort of interesting approach um, to getting the world out there and sort of making sure that New Fest sticks around for the next 30 years. So tell us a little bit about how you went about that. Yeah, so last year we actually hit our 30th anniversary of the festival, which is really a really exciting milestone. Um, but after that, we wanted to look ahead to what New Fest can mean to a new generation of queer New Yorkers, especially. Um, so this year's campaign actually uses um, old school queer personals ads mm -hmm. to kind of connect uh, specific audiences and films um, and show the queer New Yorkers that we have at our festival and, and new ones to our festival that we have what they're looking for. Um, and we actually created a queer movie hotline. Uh, you can call 1-833-NEWFEST and our wonderful celebrity operator Wanda Sykes will actually walk you through several of the films that are playing at the festival um, and you can select different uh, topics. You know, we have uh, lesbian drama seek same, for example, and so that's very relatable. Um, we have genre bending for gender bending, intersectional for international, mask for film, um, a lot of different kind of ideas that connect really specific stories with the people who need to see them. I mean, how amazing. I want everyone to call in. Just to, I mean, have a little one-on-one -on -one with Wanda, but uh, such a sort of dynamic approach. And, you know, maybe you can also speak to this too. I feel like sort of the main barrier that filmmakers, queer filmmakers face sort of boils down to funding um, and that for a film to be made, especially to be seen by a mainstream audience, there needs to be a big studio investing in it. So what are sort of the challenges, and maybe you also speak to this, Alexis, of sort of funding a film and then what does it mean to have it placed at a festival like New Fest? You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll try to keep it really short. Um, I received no major funding for my film at all. Um, and that's extremely common for independent queer filmmakers, especially for folks um, who are women or trans. 
to be honest. Um, and so it remains a challenge and it will remain a challenge as long as folks don't. Um, I, I love the fact that in the documentary community there's a huge conversation happening right now to make sure that filmmakers are representing communities that they are a part of. And I feel very strongly about that. It's part of why I made my film. And I think we should see the funding follow that ethos. Yeah, um, and I want to sort of loop back the opening night film, Sell By, that you mentioned earlier. Um, I was sort of really excited to see the festival start out on a lighter note um, because so often, as you know, I think you mentioned, the, the slice of life that we get is pretty tragic. And a festival like this really shows um, just how different and how sort of vibrant all these different queer experiences are. Um, and I love that, you know, we want romantic comedies too. We want lighter fare too. So was that sort of an intentional choice to start it out like that? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great film. It's, um, it really captures the spirit of New York and it is um, celebratory and it's, um, and you know, there are some dramatic moments, but it is, it is a romantic comedy. We have another romantic comedy um, playing on Saturday of the festival called Straight Up, which is really, I think, what the future of romantic comedy could look like. Um, it just sort of turns it on its head and, and really queers the whole genre but has all of the um, aspects that we that we love about romantic comedies. Um, and queer people in particular love romantic comedies. And so I think it's really exciting to see um, to see more of these being made um, with queer characters uh, front and center and um, and allowing us to, to laugh and feel with these characters. Yeah, and uh, we actually, on top of our features, we actually decided to introduce a comedy shorts program this year, too. Uh, it's called The Gags All Here. Um, <laughs> These names are all so good. You're like, know, right? whoever yeah, did this. Outer Borough Realness shorts as well. Um, but yeah, The Gags All Here is a great collection of 10 different um, shorts uh, uh, that are extremely hilarious and extremely fun. Um, and what we're doing, even as an extension beyond the shorts program that we're showing at the SBA Theater on the Sunday, um, is we're doing a queer comedian storytelling Telling Hour showcase um, at the LGBT Community Center directly following um, with some of the great queer comedians of New York City. Um, so we definitely want to play on the fact that there's not only sort of oppression in the world towards LGBTQ individuals that we want to advocate for, but that we're a celebration of queer life and experience too. So um, the prompt for the Queer Comedian Storytelling Hour too is, when, did, when was your first time Dot, 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 you saw yourself reflected on screen. There's been some really good answers so far in our pre-screening, so everyone has to come out for that. And you also mentioned, quickly, I want to uh, bring in, there's a slate directed at teen, uh, about teens' lives, teen films, um, that uh, you're partnering with sort of local public high schools to sort of get kids into the theater. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, when we did a Love, Simon screening, um, we were able to start a really great partnership with the New York City Department of Education. Um, and since then, we've been able to do multiple screenings that we consider our after-school program, um, where I'm able to provide um, a curated selection of short films that focus on queer teens from throughout the world. Um, last year at the festival, we were able to provide three different screenings, and we're doing the same exact thing this year. Um, but it's even more expanded beyond public schools to include all schools throughout New York City as well, because uh, we think it's really important for teenagers to be able to see themselves reflected on screen, but also to join as a community together in the space, too, and share what the stories mean to them. Um, there are actually some of my favorite Q&As that happen during the film festivals are between the filmmakers and the high school students, um, because I've had experiences where um, it wasn't just them reflecting what they saw on screen, but being able to say like, this spoke to an experience I just had when I was talking to my parents last year about coming out. And I saw that resonated here. And I know when I go back home, I'm gonna tell them about this mm -hmm. and recommend that they seek this film out in the future too, and hopefully tell more of their friends about this as well. Um, so it's seeing that impact that really makes it all worth putting together a slate of over 160 <laughs> films within seven days, but, uh, but that's why we do it, and, um, and, and just mostly delighted to see the impact that it makes, too. Before we go to audience q and I, I would love to hear from each of you. With such like a robust history uh, that the New Fest have, what are you hopeful for sort of the future, the next 30 years? Uh, what sort of stories or films do you want New Fest to feature going forward? I mean, I think the beauty in that question is that we can't necessarily imagine even, you know, what our queer minds and stories are going to look like. Um, I think one thing I really love to watch is just how kind of the, the queer members of Gen Z are 
changing what queerness means um, in so many ways, even for me. Um, and just seeing how that's going to evolve, I'm really excited for. And I know just looking at you know the 160 films that we have at this year's festival, there's so much possibility and there's so many different you know, stories and, and just films that I could not have imagined. So for the future of New Fest and the future of queer film, is it's kind of uh, uncharted territory and it's, and it's a very exciting kind of prospect to see what, what we'll come up with. <laughs> Uh, I would just say, yeah, the, the the hunger for queer representation hasn't ceased in my experience. The folks I talked to for the film are still seeking it. I'm still seeking it. There's so many stories left to tell, and no one film can possibly cover the whole gamut. And so just more. Keep going. Keep making films. Yes, I love that. Yes, more and more together. You know, at this at this point, we can all sit on our couch, and we have so much content at our fingertips. And so... What is it that gets us out of our homes and having a human experience and a connection uh, around art and around stories and um, you know seeing stories of people who don't look like us or identify like us ha has the ability, I think, to create uh, compassion and empathy and understanding and and allyship um, that will really serve our community. So I, I think. Um, Hopefully, New Fest will continue to invest in creating those spaces, like uh, like Alexis's film. Um, uh, you know, really make it a, an incredible argument for for that community building to keep happening. And I think we talk a lot about collaboration, what that means for community, and like you know, it's it's directly represented in what a festival is as well. Um, something that I love year after year is seeing filmmakers connect with each other, and next year coming back with the film together. Um, and who knows? I think when I think of the future, um, and I think of our festival, I think about the filmmakers themselves. Um, we have a lot of established filmmakers um, that we show the work of. Um, we have two films that are the Oscar nominations for their individual countries, um, but we also have tons and tons and tons of emerging filmmakers that this may have been their thesis film at NYU and they submitted to our festival and we loved it and it's part of our shorts program. This is some of the first attention they're getting for their work in a massive landscape like that, connecting with industry professionals, with press at our festival. But once again, I always come back to filmmakers mm -hmm. talking to each other and finding out how they can combine their own experiences to make a more full, comprehensive and beautiful portrait in the future too. NYU people in the audience, I hope you're taking notes. Um, let's turn it over for questions. Hi, there. Hi. First of all, congrats on the festival. It seems like you have a really exciting uh, slate of films. My question is, in what ways do you think representation has improved over the years, and in what aspects do you think it can, we can do better? Well, um, yeah, I think uh, I'm sure Nick can fill this out as a director of programming, but... Um, I, we get this question a lot as a queer film festival, and I think we, you know, we've seen such an explosion of queer representation on you know, platforms like Netflix and Hulu, and also things do change in Hollywood slowly over time. But um, I think what's special about creating this space in our festival is that everything is queer, and there's so many more representations that don't make it to Hollywood and don't make it to Netflix. Um, and as David was saying before, bringing these out of the computer and out of YouTube, um, allow people to connect with them in person. So I think it's it's sort of about, you know, how are we experiencing that queer representation, even though there's more of it? What's the quality of it? Who's telling those stories, which I think Alexis has spoken to? Um, are these people from our communities and who are still being left behind? Um, and at New Fest, you can find everything. So it's it's a really important space to keep alive. Yeah, I think it's about providing a space that is, you know, very much an empowering space, too, of, like, these are stories, and you have your own story. We want you to tell it, too. Um, and beyond that is understanding access. Um, we work throughout the year and during the festival as well, working with community partners um, to provide discount codes and free tickets. Um, beyond our high school program, um, you know, we partner with PFLAG on drag kids to be able to let a lot of parents know that they can come and access this too. Um, Global Action Project is um, a really great organization that works with young, empowering filmmakers throughout the boroughs, um, and we are able to provide free tickets for them as well. Um, so we always just want to make sure that, like, it's all in spreading the word because we can't provide visibility without everyone else providing visibility for the platform we're providing as well. Um, so we encourage you to tell everyone about it too. Uh, we have one more question for you. Great. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I was just wondering, so a lot of times queer films have been kind of confined to a specific genre and even then usually like historical drama or just drama in general. 
Um, over these past few years, we've kind of seen it expand past that. I was wondering if there's any genres in particular you'd like to see more of a queer narrative applied to. I was going to say, I'm very excited for the Halloween yes. queer horror. Yeah. That I was like, niche, hello. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a sidebar called Halloween. Um, our festival goes from October 23rd to the 29th. Um, and last year, we decided to dub Halloween our sidebar. Um, we have three really wonderful features. Um, one called Bit uh, that stars Nicole Maines, who you may know from Supergirl. Um, and it's a wonderful intersectional feminist vampire film. Um, and then we also have a film um, called Brief Story from the Green Planet that comes from Argentina um, and is actually something that transcends genre in so many ways. It's kind of like a spaghetti western E.T. meets the Goonies adventure film um, with an alien that needs to find home and three friends that are trying to help him get there. Um, and then we also this year have a Holoqueen centerpiece um, that profiles, um, it's called uh, Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, um, and it's a documentary that focuses on the star of Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, um, which has been um, sort of taken back by the queer community as a film filled with queer subtext. Um, this documentary profiles Mark Patton as he sees it as being shoved back in the closet by the Hollywood system um, after there were a lot of comments about him sort of making the film gay because he was out and proud. Um, that is a really great film essay as well that um, profiles the height of the AIDS crisis in the 80s and how it pushed a whole host of actors and other filmmakers back in the closet um, for fear of coming out and not being able to find jobs which we are still unfortunately potentially facing today. Any other genres or? Yeah, I, you know, I think as Alexis was saying earlier, like we just want more, you know, um, obviously we, you know, with 160 films, we, you can, you can see how hungry we are to get these films in front of audiences and with how intersectional our community is, there's no reason that there shouldn't be more trans romantic comedies and, uh, and, dramas that take place in in um, situations and and circumstances that are, are not usually given visibility and so I think there's real the sky is the limit right like we you know it's only been in the last couple of decades that we've started to make some inroads and so I think just give us give us more give it all to us well thank you all for your work and it's so important that this festival exists um, and everybody make sure to check it out in the city later this month starting October 23rd right um, uh, let's give it up for new fest everybody thank you so thank much yeah